بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن ولا أما بعد. So my topic for today, as was mentioned by the MC, is the family crisis, and that entails treatment of your parents and maintaining relationships and familial ties. So relationship with your kin, your family, and not severing ties with them. And today, in today's age, in 2020, the institution of family unit, right, the family institution itself, is not under attack, but it's constantly trying to be changed. Even 20, maybe 30 years ago, the idea of a family was entirely different than it is now. Before, you used to just have, you know, one of the parents would go out to work, the other one would stay at home and take care of the household, which, in fact, is encouraged by Islam itself. But nowadays, there's been a huge shift. And this, this shift itself has caused a lot of, uh, I don't want to say problems, but it, it comes with its own problems where there's not enough time dedicated to the family itself. But before I get to parents and your relatives, I kind of want to go into the, you know, the nerdy, geeky aspect of uh, explaining things from an Islamic aspect. So whenever you open up books of fiqh or any, any book pertaining to Islamic sciences, they like to define terms. So first off, we're talking about major sins, right? The lecture series as a whole is about major sins. So first off, you have to go into what is a sin? And in the Qur'an itself, you have a few words to describe the word sin. One of those words is akhta'a. Okay? In the Qur'an it says khati'atuhu, khata'yakum. And this verb or this word akhta'a, which means to sin, comes from the root meaning to make a mistake. Because we don't always fall into sin on accident. Or, let me clarify, to, by, with, your, with the pure intention of committing a sin. Sometimes we do, but sometimes we just we make mistakes. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most merciful. So calling it khati'ah is a mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showing us that we could have possibly just made a mistake. Maybe I didn't mean to do that, but it ended up happening anyways. And it tells us that when we make a mistake, we can just turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The next one is dhanbun, which maybe you hear a lot in du'as. Allahumma ghfir li dhanbi or dhunubi. And this means to commit an offense, meaning you, you, broke, you broke some rule, you did something wrong, you were guilty of committing some type of offense. And after that is a little bit more serious of a term, and that is ithm. The word ithm entails that something evil took place. And that's very serious, you committed an evil act. And sometimes you will hear the word itham being mentioned after shirk is mentioned. And itham can also mean that it's not just evil, but it also is preventing you from doing something good. Another word mentioned is ma'asiyah. It says ma'asiyatir rasul in Surah Al Mujadila. And this entails that you disobeyed. So when we commit a sin, it's when we disobey the commandment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When we transgress the bounds that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has set for us. So this is where ma'asiyah comes in. We disobeyed the commandment of Allah. And that caused us, or the result of that is a sin. And then lastly, the word sayyi'ah is mentioned. And sayyi'ah 
means a sin but a minor sin. Right? In Arabic, the major sins are called al-kaba'ir, al-kaba'ir, which in and of itself just means major. So the major sins are al-kaba'ir, but a minor sin is called sayyia, which is mentioned in the Quran. وَنُكَفِّرْ عَنْكُمْ سَيِّئَاتِكُمْ Right? Meaning that the whole ayah itself says that if you stay away from the kaba'ir, the major sins, and you are aware of what you're doing, and you stay away from them knowingly, then the rest, they'll just be wiped out eventually by doing good deeds. They don't just sit there and then they just go away poof, right, vanished into thin air. With, they, they go away with doing good deeds. These are the sayyiat, right? These are the minor sins. And that begs the question, is there a difference between sins? Is one sin more grievous than the other? Is one sin weighed more heavily than the other? And the answer, the clear-cut answer is yes. The majority of scholars have mentioned that this difference between sins it's mainly a linguistic difference. We just call it major and minor. A sin is a sin. But linguistically, we call one major because it does weigh heavier on your scales. And the Prophet ﷺ mentioned it in the hadith. It was quoted to you. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions it in the Quran. So there are differences. And the most obvious and the most heinous and grievous and evil and the biggest major sin you could commit is what? Shirk. Associating others with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there's so many ayats. Inna Allah la yaghfiru an yushraka bihi wa yaghfiru ma duna thalika liman yasha. Wa'abudu Allah wa la tushriku bihi shay'a. So shirk is one of the worst or the worst sin that you can commit. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran that He does not forgive shirk. So in order for us to hope for forgiveness for committing shirk, we have to turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, repent, right, do tawbah, and then if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants, He'll forgive it. Right? If we commit shirk, don't think that, oh, it's never going to be forgiven, I can't do anything about it. No, it's still upon us to Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness. To repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in, in the proper manner, in the proper fashion. And to stay away and to leave that which we were doing before. And then if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so chooses, He will forgive us if He wants to. And maybe He will forgive us by giving us some type of punishment in this life or some type of punishment in the hereafter which we should all seek refuge from. Or maybe He will just forgive it and not you know, have any punishment upon us. And I ask that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protects us from committing shirk and to forgive all of our sins and to allow us to stay away from the major and the minor sins. Ameen. Now, how do we know about these sins? Of course, they're mentioned in the hadith, they're mentioned in the Quran. But some of the scholars over the years have compiled books talking about major and minor sins. And the most famous of these is called Al-Kaba'ir. And who is this by? Who can tell me the author of Al-Kaba'ir? Very famous uh, hadith scholar. Imam? Imam al-Zahabi. There's other books by the name of the major sins. But the most famous one is by Imam al-Zahabi. Imam al-Zahabi, rahimahullah, he, com he compiled this book basically just putting together ayat and ahadith and athar, right? Ayahs from the Qur'an, sayings from the Prophet wasallam, and sayings from the righteous predecessors. And he even brought in sayings from, from the Torah and other, other scriptures just to show you that it's not just, it's not just from the Muslims. Right? There's, other, there's other religions that talk about how major these sins are. And I'll go into some of those, inshaAllah. So Imam al-Dhahbi, he has a book and it's been translated. You can find 
the PDF online, uh, it's not, the, the online PDF is not that great. There's uh, one by Darut Taqwa. I, it's on, I mean, it's on Amazon. I don't know how well Amazon runs here. But I'm sure if you, uh, it has, the, the one that's good, it has a red cover. And it says Al Kabair. And um, on the front it says, La taqnatu min rahmatillah. So if you can find that one, that one is very nice. I would recommend that. Or else, uh, if you can read Arabic, then I recommend you just search online for Al Kabair and, and the PDF, and you can find it online, inshallah. So, without further ado, I'll get into my main topic. And the first, of, first part of my main topic is what is called Uquq al Walidain. Right? Disrespecting your parents. And I'm sure this is nothing new to any of you. The, the importance of honoring our parents. We're treating them kindly, with goodness. There's so many examples that we've heard our entire lives. And what does the Qur'an and the Sunnah and our pious predecessors, what do they say about this? So I'll actually quote a few of the verses in the ahadith mentioned by Imam al-Dhahabi. And it's interesting to note that in the Qur'an itself and in the ahadith of our beloved Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, disrespecting your parents is usually paired or comes after, comes after what? Comes after shirk. Earlier I mentioned wa abudullaha wa la tushriku bihi shay'a. What comes after that? Wa bil walidaini ihsana. Worship Allah and do not associate anything with Him. And then what? And to your parents, right? To your parents, be righteous to your parents, be good to your parents. Treat them with goodness. And in the ahadith, you know, should I not tell you about the major sins? The Prophet ﷺ asked his companions. He said, do not associate with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then, be good to your parents. Do not disrespect your parents. So it shows you the rank of disrespecting your parents. The rank, the weight of the sin that is disrespect to your parents. And we have probably the most famous ayah concerning disrespect and honoring your parents. It's in Surah Al-Isra and it goes after A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaytanir Rajeem وَقَضَى رَبُّكَ أَلَّا تَعْبُدُوا إِلَّا إِيَّاهُ وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا إِمَّا يَبْلُغَنَّ عِنْدَكَ الْكِبَرَ أَحَدُهُمَا أَوْ كِلَاهُمَا فَلَا تَقُلْ لَهُمَا أُفٍّ وَلَا تَنْهَرْهُمَا وَقُلْ لَهُمَا قَوْلًا كَرِيمًا وَاخْفِضْ لَهُمَا جَنَاحَ الذُّلِّ مِنَ الرَّحْمَةِ وَقُلْ رَبِّ ارْحَمْهُمَا وَقُلْ رَبِّ ارْحَمْهُمَا كَمَا رَبَّيَانِي صَغِيرًا From a very very young age, I guarantee you all heard this at some point in your life. Whether it was your parents paraphrasing when you would anger them, or make them upset, or you would raise your voice at them, or if it was a teacher telling you, or if it was the Imam making dua in, in after, you know, uh, in witr or any, any dua that you heard before. And it says, وَقَضَى رَبُّكَ right? Our Lord has ordained for us to worship Him, only Him, right? I mentioned shirk and disrespecting your parents, usually mentioned hand in hand. وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا And to your parents, be kind to them. Goodness towards your parents. If you find them in old age, or one of them, or both of them, don't ever say to them, Oof. And does, is this from a literal sense? Does that mean that the only word we're not allowed to say to our parents is Oof? No, this just shows, this is a type of mubalagha, this is a type of, um, it just shows, it's an expression that shows that, look, 
in the Arabic language, one of the most simple sounds you can make is uf. This shows the simplicity of the term uf. So nowadays, you'll see that kids, they'll do something else. They might go, or ah. There's so many different expressions of frustration, which is what this ayah is referring to. You, we are not allowed to express frustration towards our parents. We need to deal with them with honor and speak to them with honor. We're not allowed to speak to them with contempt, nor are we allowed to push them away. A lot of times, if we argue with our parents or disagree with our parents, it's easy for us to just raise our voice and storm off. We are not allowed to do this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is commanding us. He's not, he's not giving a suggestion. Right? This, isn't, this isn't a type of suggestion that, look, you know, it's going to happen, you're going to disagree with your parents. You know, maybe try not to raise your voice. No, he's telling us, no, we're not absolutely not allowed to raise our voice to our parents. We're not allowed to uh, express frustration towards them. We cannot push them away or turn away from them. Instead, we address them with terms of honor. وَقُولُوا وَقُلْ لَهُمَا قَوْلًا كَرِيمًا قَوْلًا كَرِيمًا right? Kareem is noble, honorable. So honorable expressions, honorable words. And out of kindness towards them because of everything they have ever done for, the, for us in our lifetimes. It says, جَنَاحَ ذُلِّي right? Lower for them the wings of humility. Lower yourself to them. No matter who you are, no matter who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chooses for you to be in this life, you can be a king, but at the end of the day, who is still going to be above you? Who is still going to be above us? No matter who we are, it's still going to be our parents. So we have to lower ourselves with humility. And we say to them, and we say for them, O oh my Lord, وَقُلْ رَبِّ ارْحَمْهُمَا Have mercy upon the both of them. كَمَا رَبَّيَانِ صغيرا. The same way they brought us up, the same way they cherished us, the same way they protected us, the same way they gave their blood, sweat and tears for us when we were young, in our childhood. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran, وَوَصَّيْنَا الْإِنسَانَ بِوَالِدَيْهِ husna." And in other ayahs he says, وَوَصَّيْنَا الْإِنسَانَ بِوَالِدَيْهِ إِحْسَانًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is advising us, is advising man, not just the Muslims, all of mankind. وَوَصَّيْنَا الْإِنسَانَ بِوَالِدَيْهِ إِحْسَانَ With kindness, with goodness to your parents. And then as was mentioned before, the, the hadith, right? should I not tell you about the major sins? And then he mentioned, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, from them, عُقُوقَ uh, الْوَالِدَيْنِ Disrespect towards your parents. And this, this is uh, mentioned in Muslim and Bukhari. And then it starts to get a little bit scarier. The hadith is beautiful itself, but when you really think about it, the connection between pleasing our parents and pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it makes you think, it makes you want to think twice about ever, ever disrespecting your parents. And the next hadith goes that. The pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in the pleasure of the parents. And the displeasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is with the displeasure of the parent. So if our parents are not pleased with us, we can't even start to hope that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to be pleased with us. And this is also a sahih hadith. And another hadith mentioned is that الوالد أوسط أبواب الجنة The father, the parent is the middle gate 
of paradise. Meaning that one of the easiest gates for us to enter through paradise is the one through our parents. So if you want this gate to be for you, if you want to enter this gate, then protect it. And if not, then, then let it go. If you let go of your parents, then you can, you can let go of that gate of paradise. And this was made authentic or authenticated by a tirmidhi And then the famous hadith. Famous hadith. Al-Jannatu tahta aqdam al-ummahat. Jannah is where? Under the feet of our mothers. Under the feet of the mothers. Right? And you know, growing up, our teachers like to joke around with us as little kids. You know, like that, he, they would tell us, don't go and, you know, start looking under your mother's feet. And like, where's Jannah? Where's Jannah? No, but treating our mothers with the utmost respect, which we can never repay them for. Never, never, ever, ever. Famous uh, story of Ibn Umar radiallahu an, anhumah. He was in Mecca and he was observing a man doing tawaf around the Kaaba. And what was this man doing? He had his mother on his shoulders. And after this man completed his tawaf, he came to Ibn Umar radiallahu anhuma and he said that, you know, I am in service to my mother. Even if her ride, her camel gets tired, I will not get tired on her behalf. So then he asked Ibn Umar, have I repaid her in any way? And what did Ibn Umar say, radiallahu anhuma? Not even for a single contraction. Not even, not even close. A single contraction. How many contractions to, do women have before giving birth? During labor, it just gets stronger and stronger and stronger. So not carrying your mother on your shoulders and going around the Kaaba seven times is not even close enough to repaying her for one simple contraction. I don't want to say simple, it's not a simple contraction. But just one contraction, it's not enough. And it's also mentioned, and this, this can be something tied into maintaining ties with your family. Right? Silatul Rahim, uh, the bonds of kinship. Right? Who else is considered to be your mother? Your aunt. Your aunt. It is said that your aunt, meaning your mother's sister, is considered to be your own mother. So if you're not treating your aunt right, then don't expect to receive the same reward as treating your mother right. You're falling into dangerous waters when you don't treat even your aunts correctly or properly. So we need to also look at our aunts, our mother's sisters, if she has any. And treat them with the, in the same manner that we treat our own mothers. And in some cultures, and I believe it to be most cultures, even without having told this to you, if I was to ask you who would you consider like a second mother to you, I'm pretty sure most of us would have said, our aunt, my mother's sister. I know it's true for me. I know it's true for my wife. Our, and in Arabic, the word for, for an is the same as, you know, Bangla in Urdu, right? We, it's khala. Khala is your mother's sister. Your khala, she'll even treat you just like you're her own child. She'll love you just like you're her own child. And subhanAllah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts that love for us naturally that we have for our mother. It's similar of that of our love for our aunt. And then there is a beautiful story where a man came to the Prophet ﷺ and he was so eager, so eager to go for jihad. And he asked the Prophet ﷺ, you know, can, can I go for jihad with you? Can I go fight and give up my life for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with you, O Messenger of Allah? And what did, what did he ask him? Did he say, did he, did he sallallahu alayhi wasallam ask him, do you have any children? You know, do you have any debts? Uh, do, is there anything else you need to take care of? No, he asked this man, Ahayyun waliduka? 
are your parents alive? And what did he say? What did the man answer? Yes, they're alive. So then he said, go back to them. Treat them kindly. That is your jihad. And in other narrations, it is mentioned that a man came and asked the Prophet ﷺ permission to go out for jihad with him. And the man had mentioned that his parents were crying when he left. You know, I left my parents for you. They were crying. And he told this man, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, told the man, go back to them and make them laugh where you made them cry. Treat them good where you caused them grief. So in this day and age, there's, there's no jihad for us. But we can find it in other things like treating our parents good, treating them with kindness, making sure they're okay. Subhanallah, if, if you know who Shaykh Suleiman Mullah is from South Africa, he is said to be one of the most eloquent speakers. His transition between Arabic and English is almost flawless. It's as if he grew up speaking Arabic and English his entire life. And one day somebody asked him, you know, Shaykh, how are you like this? You know, what do you attribute your success to? And I was told this story, I didn't hear it from him directly, but I believe the source. And he said, you know, before I have a talk, especially before I need to travel, I'll call my mother up and see how she's doing and see if she needs anything at all. And then he said he feels like this, if, if he has any success at all in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he feels as if this is the reason why. Just because he makes it a point to check on her every single time. Every single time, without fail. So there's many lessons in this for us. So many benefits. And there's more ahadith that show us that treating our family and treating our parents with kindness can only bring goodness in our lives. That will come later, inshallah. Next. The Prophet وسلم, Imam al Dhahabi mentions, the Prophet وسلم, says, لا يدخل الجنة عاق. The one who cuts ties with his family will not enter paradise. They will not enter paradise. Right? This means that if we die with any of our familial ties severed, we don't have the hope of entering paradise. And it was mentioned by Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said uh, sorry that a man in, in Arab came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and said Ya Rasulullah mal kabair What are the major sins? And then he said Al-ishraku billah or in another narration Ashirku billah And then what did he say after that? The man asked him Thumma madha And then what? Then, then the Prophet ﷺ said, Thumma عقوق الوالدين. And again it was mentioned, لا يدخل الجنة عاق in another hadith. So it's been mentioned on multiple occasions. You know, the person who cuts ties will not enter paradise. And then, SubhanAllah, there's such... It's, it's, these are very deep ahadith. When, when, I was, when I was looking into these ahadith, I had heard them before, but when you really look into to it yourself, it really hits you hard. It hits you very, very hard. And it makes, you, it makes you think about what have you been doing your whole life with your parents. Even if, you know, mashallah, tabarakallah, if you had been a good child to your parents their entire lives, it, it does make you think, am I doing enough? Am I doing the right thing? Have I done my duty? Have I fulfilled their rights upon them? Their rights upon me? So it was mentioned that every bad deed, every dhunub, and I mentioned uh, them or dhunub has the meaning of committing an offense. Meaning you broke, you broke a law. You, you did something wrong, you committed an offense, and you were found guilty of it. This is the connotation that is carried with the word dhamb and dhunub. Kullu dhunub, every bad deed, every sin, 
can be delayed. The punishment for it can be delayed. However Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wills. It can be delayed to a later time in this life. It can be delayed until the day of judgment. Of course, we don't hope for any punishment to be upon us. We hope and we pray and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us for every single one of our sins and our misdeeds. But every sin can be delayed. Its punishment can be delayed to the day of judgment except disrespecting your parents. For disrespecting your parents, the punishment for it will be expedited to the one who does it. If we disrespect our parents, you can expect its punishment to come right away. Right away. So, you know, next time we might raise our voice to our parents, we should look over our shoulders to make sure that everything's going right. We should keep this in the back of our minds. Not even the back of our minds. We should keep it at the forefront. Because it, it's, it's very natural. It's not always that. You know, parent and child would get along. It's not always that. You know, everything runs smoothly. It's not all rainbows and fairy tales. Sometimes it's a tragedy. Sometimes it's, you know, most of the time actually, it's probably a drama. Something, something's going on. Maybe you want to do something, your parents don't approve. Maybe they ask or request something from you, and maybe it just, it just you know, irks you. It just hits a nerve with you. But we need to remember that if we show any disrespect towards them, who's, who's, who's got their back? Who's got our parents' back? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He has their back. He's going to take their side no matter what. And you know, there's no dua. There's no dua that's accepted more readily than the dua of a parent for their child. Whether it's a good dua or a bad dua. Whether it's a dua for you or a dua against you. We should always be asking our parents for their dua. But if we disrespect them, we better hope. We better hope. And I, I personally believe that no parent truly wants to make dua against their child. You have, you know, it, it has to be something really, really messed up for a parent to make dua against their child. But if that day ever comes, you know, there, there's, there's nothing, there's nothing to protect us. We seek refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from these things. And with, with a sound, with a good chain, it was mentioned that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala curses, curses the one who breaks ties with his parents. And I mentioned earlier that the, the aunt has the same, is in the same place. The hadith goes, Al khalatu bi manzilatil um. The khal is in the same manzil, the same manzil, the same station, the same place. The same has the same holds the same weight as the mother, and this is mentioned in Tirmidhi as well. So now that I've spoken about or relayed to you a few of the things mentioned about disrespecting the parents, I want to quickly go into cutting ties with your kin, and it's called silatur rahim. Cutting ties is called qatiur rahim. Sila is maintaining, right? Connecting, enjoining. And qati' is literally the one who cuts. The one who cuts the ties of the womb. The rahim is the womb. And it's called the womb because it comes from the same root as rahmah. There's mercy and love in the womb. The first feeling of love that a human receives from another human is in the womb. Because who is it that's carrying you for approximately 40 weeks? It's your mother. And who loves you more than any other creation in this universe? It's your mother. But who is it that places you in that womb that loves you even more than your mother loves you? It's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So our love begins in the womb. Our mercy begins in the womb. This is why it's called Rahim. And it's mentioned in the Quran in the first ayah of Surah An-Nisa 
واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us to fear him but then there's a very interesting grammatical difference that comes at, at the end of this ayah وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ الَّذِي تَسَاءَلُونَ بِهِ وَالْأَرْحَامِ it's, it's normal to stop at this word arham but if you continue right in hafs in the, in the normal qira'ah uh, that, that's, that's around the world or majority of the world it says وَالْأَرْحَامَ وَالْأَرْحَامَ so this is going back to وَاتَّقُوا so fear Allah and fear cutting ties of kinship or it can be arhami al arhami this would go back to tasa'aluna bihi wal arhami meaning tasa'aluna bihi wa tasa'aluna bil arhami right so fear allah through whom through the one who you demand your mutual rights and through your kinship this is how you fear Allah or as is most commonly shown throughout uh, in the Mus'haf Hafs and Asim which is the famous Qira'ah recited in the majority of the world fear Allah and fear cutting ties of kinship so it shows you the seriousness of cutting the ties of kinship you need to fear Allah and then what after that? fear cutting the ties of kinship and it's also mentioned in the Quran. فَهَلْ عَسَيْتُمْ إِن تَوَلَّيْتُمْ أَن تُفْسِدُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ وَتُقَطِّعُوا أَرْحَامَكُمْ So, أَن تُفْسِدُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us, you know, are these people going to hope that they spread fasad around the world and cut ties of kinship? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about those people, أُولَٰئِكَ الَّذِينَ لَعَنَهُمُ اللَّهُ فَأَصَمَّهُمْ وَأَعْمَىٰ أَبْصَارَهُمْ Those people are the ones that are cursed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and He has made them deaf and He has made their eyes blind. These are the people who want to spread fasad around the earth and the ones who want to cut the ties of kinship. And then there's many a hadith encouraging keeping the ties of kinship. مَنْ كَانَ يُؤْمِنُ بِاللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ فَلْيَصِلْ رَحِيمَهِ The one who believes in Allah in the last day, keep the ties of kinship. And a beautiful hadith which is mentioned in Bukhari and Muslim, إِنَّ اللَّهَ خَلَقَ الْخَلْقِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created creation. And when He was done, the, the, the womb, the rahim, it stood up, it came alive. And it said, in this place I seek refuge in, a, in you Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from people cutting me off. So then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, yes, as for the ones who keep these ties with you, I will be pleased with them, so you be pleased with them. The ones who do not cut me off and do not cut you off, we will be pleased with them. But for the ones who cut you off, I will cut them off. So then, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is basically asking the womb, is this okay with you? And the womb says, yes, this is okay. And then, subhanahu this is a beautiful hadith. Man ahabba ay yubsata lahu fi rizqihi وَيُنْسَأَ لَهُ فِي أَثَرِهِ فَلْيَصِلْ رَحِمَهِ The one who loves that his wealth increases and the one who wants, you know, his, his basically his, his, himself to be known for, for himself to have everlasting, uh, you know, to be, to be known to, to everyone else. If you want good or your goodness to be, to be uh, increased for you, what do you do? You keep the ties of kinship. So if we want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to increase us in this life, we need to maintain our ties of kinship. And subhanAllah, the hadith, the hadith just get more and more beautiful. 
Ar-Rahimu Mu'allaqa bil Arsh. The womb is connected to the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Taqul man wasalani wasalahu Allah. Right? The womb will say, it will say the one who maintains my ties will maintain the ties with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the one who cuts me off, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will cut them off. And then it is mentioned from Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Ana rahman Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, I am al-Rahman. And this attribute of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, al-Rahman, is only for Him. It is only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is the only one capable of being al-Rahman. We are capable of showing mercy. Even the animals are capable of showing mercy. But are we capable of showing mercy over and over again? No matter how many times, no matter how many times somebody goes against us or tries to harm us or violates our rights, it's impossible for a human to do that. It's impossible. Only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is capable of this type of mercy. He is capable of this type of mercy not only for the believers for the, but for the disbelievers as well. So Allah is saying, I am Ar-Rahman and it is the womb, Ar-Rahim. See, there's a connection between Rahman and Rahim, which is why from all of his attributes, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose to say in this hadith Qudsi that I am Ar-Rahman. So the one who maintains it, I am going to maintain my ties with him. But the one who cuts it off, I will cut him off. So you see, there's a pattern, right? In order to maintain our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we absolutely have to maintain our relationship with our families. So I believe it's break time now. Five minutes, inshallah. Okay. So after this, inshallah, I'll go over, you know, our obligations towards our parents and you know different causes as to why uh, there's there may be conflict between parents and 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 child and between families, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum everyone. Bismillah alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah. I hope you all were able to uh, get refreshed during the break. You know, mashallah, I was uh, glad to see everybody participating in the quiz, but uh, brothers, shame, shame, shame. I don't think a single one of you placed in the top three, right? No? Uh, before I, I move on, there was um, one hadith that I mentioned, Man ahabba ayyub sadafi rizqihi. The correct translation of this hadith is the one who loves to have his, his provisions or his sustenance increased, and the one who wishes for his life to be prolonged, he should maintain the ties of kinship. So you want, the, you want, you want to know the, the secret to a long life? There you go. Prophet ﷺ told it to us. You want to know the secret to, uh, to wealth and health and uh, success? There you go, right? Islam has all the answers, mashallah. So, uh, there, were, there were two narrations that actually I completely skipped over. And uh, I'm sorry I've been bombarding you with uh, ayat and hadith, but this is what our religion is, right? It's the Quran and the Sunnah. Uh, so, it, it's still just as important. One is, we always hear about our mothers and how important they are that our mother, we, you know, we, we are good and we love our mother the most, three times more, and then the father. But what about the father? Right? What about the father? There is a beautiful hadith where it was said that the Prophet ﷺ said, you can never repay your father. A son or a child can never repay the father or the parent unless, unless you happen to find them as a slave and you buy them in order to set them free. Think about that. Is that even possible nowadays? No, it's not. 
This is the only way a son can repay his father for the kindness and the care and the hard work that he received from his father. Is if you happen to find your father as a slave, Mamluk. So you purchase him and you set him free. It's just to show you that it's impossible for us to repay our parents. And then the other hadith, which is very beautiful, is that a man came to the Prophet ﷺ and he asked him, O Messenger of Allah, if I pray the five prayers and I fast in Ramadan and I pay my zakah and I perform hajj, so then what is for me? What do I get for doing this? So the Prophet ﷺ answered by saying, Man fa'ala dhalika kana ma'an nabiyyin wa siddiqeen wa shuhada. And this is very similar to an ayah in uh, Surah Al Ma'idah. Surah Al Ma'idah, I believe. Sorry, Surah, sorry, Surah Al Nisa. Wa man yuti'i Allah wa rasulahu fa'ulaika ma'al ladhina. أَنْعَمَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِمْ مِنَ النَّبِيِّينَ وَالصِّدِّقِينَ وَالشُّهَدَاءِ وَالصَّالِحِينَ وَحَسُنَ أُولَٰئِكَ رَفِيقًا It's basically the same thing. The one who obeys Allah and His Messenger, meaning that you pray the five prayers, you pay your zakah, you fast during Ramadan, you perform hajj, this is obedience to Allah and His Messenger. This is what our, our, our religion is based on. You do this, you will be with the prophets and the ones who are truthful and the martyrs. But then the Prophet ﷺ said, except the one who disrespects his parents. So even if we do every single one of these actions, our five daily prayers, fasting Ramadan, giving zakah, going for hajj, going for hajj, we will not get this reward. We will not get this honor if we are disrespecting our parents. So it doesn't matter. Don't think that, you know, we cannot think that we're better than a person that honors his parents while we are disrespecting ours. Once again, I, I, ask, I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we seek refuge in him from doing these things, from associating others with him and disrespecting our parents to keep us away from it. And if we ever were to fall into any of these things that we immediately turn to him and ask for forgiveness and repent to him and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives all of our sins. Ameen. So, now I'm inshallah hopefully done bombarding you with all, all of the you know, sayings from, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa and the ones who came after, from the companions and after them. Except, I told you that I would mention some of the actually the the, the Jewish uh, narrations that were mentioned, there was a there was a companion who who used to be Jewish and he was from Yemen and he he wasn't exactly a rabbi but he was you know like one level below a rabbi he was very knowledgeable in the in the Torah, so he said that I read in the Torah or I heard from the Torah that it used to, that it would say that the one who disrespects his father should be beaten, right? We don't do this anymore, or we don't do it at all. It's not part of our religion to beat the one who disrespects his father. Maybe if, if you're sort of from certain backgrounds, you'll get a beating from your father. But we don't, we don't go and if we, if we see on the street that somebody's you know, talking back to their father, we don't just go up and, and beat them, right? We don't hit them, we don't strike them. But this is what the, this companion mentioned to be found in the Torah. So now, I'll start off with parents again. I spoke about the importance and the value given to respecting our parents. And what happens if we disrespect them. Our obligation in Islam is to obey them no matter what. Unless they are preventing us from seeking goodness or asking us to do something which is forbidden for us. 
This is the only circumstance. Whether your, your parents are Muslim or not, even if you converted to Islam and your parents have not converted yet, and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant guidance to the one whose parents have not converted yet. Because, you know, being from America, there's a lot, a lot of converts. And you can see the anguish in their faces when they speak about their parents and trying to get them to convert to Islam. The greatest gift that anybody can receive in this life is the guidance of Islam from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if you were able to receive it, if you were the one who was lucky and blessed from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to receive His guidance, of course you would want that for your parents. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide those, especially the ones whose children have converted but they have yet to convert. Ameen. Even if they are not Muslim, we ask, we have to obey them unless they keep us from goodness. You know, some of, uh, some of the students of Shaykh ibn Uthaymeen asked him, you know, I want to attend these religious circles, these halaqat, but my parents, they don't want me to. Right? They think that, you know, I can spend my time better doing something else. Or that, you know, I might just, I might go off the far end and something bad might happen to me. So the Shaykh, he mentioned that, look, this is something that is good for you. There is goodness in attending Islamic circles. You gain, you gain knowledge, you gain beneficial knowledge, which in turn increases you in your piety and increases you in your iman. So if your parents are preventing you from seeking this goodness, then at the very least, without disrespecting them, try to find a way around it. Just say that, hey, I'm going out. You don't have to tell them where you're going. If they're okay with just that much, then go and seek your goodness. Or, and this is not from the Shaykh, but we all know this, if your parents are asking you to partake in something that is clearly forbidden, clearly, right? No, no ifs, no gray area, it's clear that this is not allowed, this is haram, this is shirk. Then, we can tell them that no, but at the same time we have to maintain their honor, their dignity, our respect towards them, right? Qawlan karima. We have to speak to them with honor, honorable words, noble words towards our parents. And, you know, it's, it's very easy to look at causes and reasons why children would be disobedient and disrespectful to parents. It can be societal, right? You look at what society are you in? What is society showing to its people? Who are your children hanging out with? Who are their friends? Do they respect their parents? Are they good to their parents? Because we, we all know that children, even us as adults, we fall into the habits and the patterns of the people around us, the people that we spend most of our time with the people that we like to spend our leisure time with, we fall into it. You can tell yourself as much as you want. You know, you know, I'm not like them. I enjoy their company, but I don't do the same things as them. I don't act like them. But you spend enough time, if we spend enough time around these people, you're going to be, we're going to be just like them. So th these are the societal aspects. The second one is kind of a hard pill to swallow because no parent would ever like to admit or maybe they, they would be oblivious to the fact that they, they themselves might have something wrong with their parenting. How are we treating our children? How do we behave and act with our children? And not just with them, but with others in front of them. How do we behave with others in front of our children? Right? Is our speech proper? Is our manner proper? Are we polite? Are we showing respect and honor to others? Because our children, at the end of the day, the first people they will emulate is their parents. And then they'll start to act like their friends once they spend enough time with them. And then just naturally, some children will have a difficult disposition. They will naturally just be difficult. And for those of you who have multiple children, you can tell even from when they're babies, okay, this one is easy, this one's difficult. Right? Even if you have twins, and I have friends that have twins, 
they even admit that, look, this is the easy one, this is the difficult one. It just, it happens. You just have, you just have to figure out the child as an individual, right? There's no one size fits all for parenting. Never, never. If anybody ever tells you that, then I don't know, you make dua for them that, you know, they learn that this isn't how it works. That's why, of course, the first person that a parent will get parenting tips from is the one without children. They'll be like, oh, you should do this with your kid, right? That's, no. Never take advice from somebody that does not have children. They don't know, they don't know the pains and aches and sleepless nights and tantrums that, that a parent has to deal with. Even if they have siblings, they don't know what it's like for the parent themselves. But what are some solutions that we can look at from a parenting aspect? Number one, always, always is our sincerity, right? Our sincerity. Why are we doing this? Being a parent is a huge responsibility. Maybe we didn't choose to be a parent, or maybe we chose to be parents, but end of the day, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed you with a child. Because every child is a blessing. And every child comes with its own sustenance. And every child will increase you in your own sustenance. So that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, do not fear having children. Do not ever think about killing your children out of fear. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give them their sustenance. And He'll give us our sustenance. And subhanAllah, there was a famous story about a man who he never even thought about having daughters. And of course, in, in a lot of cultures, there's a stigma around having a daughter over a son. For some reason, certain cultures think that if you have a daughter and not a son, then you're just, you're just doomed in society. There's nothing good left for you in society. Nobody to carry on your name, nobody to take care of you, nobody to get you money. This is not true. There was a man, every single time he had a daughter, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would bless him in ways unimaginable. His business would increase or new business opportunities would come. And he would just end up, he would see himself becoming more and more wealthy. And it's mentioned, we are told by the Prophet ﷺ that each daughter that we have is a ticket to Jannah if we raise them to be righteous. That is your ticket to Jannah. And we are told that, you know, for every child that is miscarried, for every child that is miscarried, we will be reunited with them in Jannah and they will be a shield, a shield for the parent from the hellfire. No matter when the miscarriage took place in the pregnancy, the fact is that if a miscarriage took place, there will be a shield. And inshallah, you know, we, we will walk with them. They will greet us at the gates of Jannah. And then next, of course, is what we actually do for them. The tarbiyah, the, the raising them. Raising them. What are we basing our tarbiyah on? Are we basing it on how the Prophet wasallam or how, you know, the scholars have, have laid out for us, right? Our tarbiyah also itself should all be based in sincerity. Right? Ikhlas and niyyah is the most important thing for every single action that we do. Whether if it's a minuscule action or if it's something big like raising children. We always have to check our intentions, our sincerity. Why are we doing this? Who are we doing this for? We are doing this for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we are doing this because it is such a great amana placed upon each and every single parent from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then I mentioned earlier, we have to maintain good character ourselves. If our children see that, whether it's at home or outside, we're just using foul language, or we're just acting you know, in, in an unruly manner, of course the children are going to pick it up and act the exact same way. And if they see us misbehaving or being disrespectful to our parents, then what makes you think that they're going to be respectful towards us? And we have to stay close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? A family that prays together stays together. 
and you can look it up. There's, there's so many, you know, cute videos on YouTube. You can see, you know, like kids praying without having to tell them. They'll just pull out the sajada and maybe they'll line up their dolls or their toys behind them and they'll start praying, right? And the jama'ah is, is their toys, right? Maybe it's like the Avengers or something behind them. And they're, they're just, they're praying a lot and, and the child does this out of their own, their own purity because they see the prayer being established at home. They see it being established at home and they will follow suit. If Qur'an is being recited in the home, then the child will like to recite the Qur'an as well. You know, if you see kids raised in an Islamic manner and kids raised in a not-so-Islamic manner, yeah, they'll be raised by Muslim parents, but the, the Qur'an and the prayer is not an integral part, a central part of the family. You will notice that the kids who grow up with Qur'an and prayer as a central part of their family, they will talk about these things. They will talk about who their favorite reciter is or what surah they're currently memorizing or what hadith they just learned or hey, I was able to fast, what about you? You know, like, I, my parents, they celebrated my first full fast. They got me a cake and they threw a party for me. Whereas the other kids, they'll talk about like, Ben 10 or, uh, or Spider-Man or the Avengers or, or whatever is the, is the newest fad or whoever their uh, favorite football player is, right? They'll talk about, you know, who do you like more, Messi or Ronaldo? It's Ronaldo, by the way. So, they... <laughs> I hear people <laughs> reacting. Sorry, I, I'm, I'm a Ronaldo fan, so don't, don't hold me against it. But this is what they will talk about instead of, instead of something that is much better for them, like, like praying. And, and listening and reciting the Qur'an. So we have to make Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the center of our family. When it's time to pray, call your children. No matter how you know, busy you think you might be, or how tired you might think they are, just call them, it's five minutes. Call them together and, and pray. And when they get a little bit older, start taking them to the masjid. And when of course, when they're old enough, you should take them to the masjid. And th this will have a huge impact on them. It'll have a huge, huge impact on them. Have them memorize the Qur'an as much as they can throughout their life. It doesn't matter how old they are. Encourage them to memorize the Qur'an. I saw with my own eyes that kids who were sent to Qur'an schools to memorize the Qur'an, they may have taken a wrong turn in life, but eventually, eventually, if the parents were sincere and they had good character and good morals, the children would eventually turn back. They eventually turned back. Maybe they didn't completely turn back, but at the very least, they left off a lot that they were doing before. And I also guarantee you that with our children, the more we push them towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the stronger shaitan's urge will be to turn them away. Especially for those that memorize the Qur'an. If you have, if you have the urge or the plan to send your kids to do tahfid, to memorize the Qur'an, just know that shaitan is going to work even harder than you at making sure that they go the wrong way. And you'll see it, especially in the West, some of the worst kids you'll find in the community are the ones that memorize the Qur'an. They fall into all sorts of bad things. And this is because of shaitan. If you think about it from a logical perspective, it makes sense. Why wouldn't shaitan want to go after the one that is protecting the Qur'an? The one that was chosen by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to safeguard the Qur'an. If there's a kid and he's out, you know, mixing with the wrong people or the opposite gender or he's into drugs or alcohol or he's in the club or the bar. Shaitan doesn't care about that person anymore. He's gone. Maybe one day that person will decide to repent and turns back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But Shaitan does not need to work on that person. Who does he need to work on? 
the one that is dedicating themselves to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger and his book. So we have to make sure that we keep Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and stay patient throughout the entire process. Now, I was asked to talk about what the child should do. And honestly, thinking about my own life and other people's lives that I know on an intimate level, there's nothing the child can do. What is the child supposed to do except become an adult, become a responsible adult? Once you come to that point, if you cannot find a way to turn back yourself, then you, you just have to hope that your parents are making an, enough dua for you to turn back. You just have to hope. You just have to hope. And there was a story, there was a story actually that, that I heard recently when uh, Sheikh Dr. Yasir Qadi came to Malaysia, I believe it was last month, maybe. He gave a personal story where he mentioned there was a guy who he knew growing up. His father had sent him to the, to the Qur'an school to memorize the Qur'an. And he almost finished, but he dropped out. And, uh, you know, bad became worse. And he was almost at the point of just turning away from Islam. And when the Shaykh would meet him from time to time, this, this person, and you, now he's an adult, this person would just, you know, kind of mock him. You know, you're still into these fairy tales and He's talking about Islam in this manner. But then, one thing that never failed was that his father would always, always make dua for him. Always. You know, oh Allah, please let my son turn back. Please let him turn back. Please let him turn back. And he didn't turn back until his father passed away. But that doesn't mean it was too late. With his father's dua, he still turned back. He was still able to turn back. And the story has a lot more detail. It wasn't very detailed, but basically the man called up the Shaykh and he said, you know, are you home? Are you going to be in? And the Shaykh was in Memphis, Tennessee at the time. He took a flight and he visited him and he just broke down in front of him. That, you know, I, I, need, I need to change. I need to turn back. You know, I, I, I hope it's not too late. But this, this only happened because the parent did not give up on the child. The parent ne never once gave up on the child. So in my honest, humble opinion, I believe that there's really not much the child can do except grow up, become an adult, and one day hope, just hope that they themselves can turn back. And next is maintaining the ties of kinship, the, the second half of the topic. And this is a little bit shorter, but it's not any less important because you saw Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned that shirk and disrespecting the parents are mentioned side by side. And if we cut off our ties of kinship, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will cut us off. And if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cuts us off, then we have nothing. Neither in this life nor in the hereafter. So the importance I relate to you already. But what are some common issues that cause friction? between families that, will, that would lead to us cutting each other off. What happens? And I was able to think of at least three major issues and one that's not so concrete, it's slightly abstract. Because it's easy to talk about abstract issues like, oh, we don't communicate well, we don't listen well, our personalities don't mesh. But what are some things that we can really see, tangible things? And one of the biggest reasons I can think of is money. So many times, money becomes the root cause, right? Money is the root of all evil. It is one of the major reasons why families break apart. The finances aren't okay. Or, and this is a huge thing, a huge thing, that we do not focus on enough. When it comes to the will and the inheritance of a family, so many times do we overstep the rights of the other person. The brother will not give his sister his right. The, the, the son will not give his mother the right. And I, and I pinpoint on the male because they, by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's command, receive more because it is their responsibility to take care of their mother and their siblings. It's not 
after the father passes away, it's not the mother's job to take care of the son anymore financially. It's not the sister's job to pay for the brother. But the brother gets more because he needs to take care of his mother and his sister. It is not that you think that I get all this money now, I need to look out for my wife and my children. No. They get their right when you pass away. So whatever you are able to maintain, whatever we are able to maintain, us as men, they will get when we pass away. But do not ever overstep the bounds of the inheritance of your sisters and your mothers. They get what is rightfully theirs, you get what is rightfully yours. And these rights should not be overstepped. So money is a huge thing. <laughs> One that is not as serious, but it, it's a bit comical, is religion. And I don't mean difference in religion. Yes, that is one reason. You may have converted to Islam, and your parents may still be Christian or Hindu or Jewish or, or, or Buddhist, right? I mentioned that you just have to treat your parents and your other family members with the utmost respect and, and dignity and not put them down and try to portray your religion in a manner that is appealing to them, right? There's also no one size fits all when it comes to da'wah as well. You have to appeal to certain people to what appeals to them, what appeals to them. Right? You don't treat the other person how you want to be treated. You treat them how they want to be treated. You look at that person how they want to be treated. But even within Islam, people will differ. Maybe you're Hanafi and your parents are Shafi'i. Or you're Ahlul Hadith and you're, you, the rest of your family is part of a different, uh, another madhab or they follow a madhab or you're Sufi and the other person's Salafi, right? You're Athari, the other person's Ashari. This, this really causes a lot of friction, especially because there's a very toxic culture of just kicking them out of the religion altogether. That's not your job. That's not up to you to decide, right? As long as the person says, La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah, it's not up to us to decide whether or not we ever speak to them again. No. It's, it's, a very, it's a very dangerous thing that happens within families. SubhanAllah, you know uh, Sheikh Muhammad Salah who is going to give the third talk. He was uh, telling me, because I was actually surprised when he uh, mentioned that he's a Hanafi. He's from Egypt. Egypt is predominantly Shafi'i. So then he said this was actually a plan from his father. All four of his brothers studied at Al-Azhar. And all four of them was told to study a different madhab. Right? So one son for each madhab. So he told me, you can imagine, there was a lot of interesting conversations at the dinner table. I'm pretty sure they argued a lot about different you know, issues, different masail. But that doesn't mean that you, know, you, have, you, you break out into a madhab war. Right? Back in the old days, when these madhabs started uh, forming and proliferating, they used to kill each other. They used to try and beat up another person until he died. Just because maybe he wasn't Maliki, he was Shafi'i. Maybe he was Hanafi and not Shafi'i. This actually happened. And this, this, is, you know, this is a big, big slip up on, in, in our history. There was, there was no reason that this should happen, right? The scholars today, they say that, that the madhahib, the difference of opinion, is a mercy in our religion. So money and, and religion, we need to watch out for these two things. It's always maintaining respect and dignity and honor between you and that family member. Another thing is marriage. How does marriage break up families? Maybe your family forces you to marry someone you don't want to marry. Maybe you want to marry somebody that your family does not approve of. This is, you know, marriage is just a huge topic that always comes up and, sh you know, you, it, you can't cover it in one topic by itself. You have to have like a month-long conference, not even, not even a weekend, like a month-long conference about this. Right? 40 days, go, go, off, go off for 40 days and just talk about marriage and you still won't be done. But it's very tricky, right? If, if your parents 
want to want you to marry or your family as in general wants you to marry someone unless you find something absolutely wrong with them that that would affect your own iman and your own religion we should at least give it a try just give it a shot do your due diligence if they try and force you then just make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that if it's best for you to not pursue this then uh, you know let it go let it leave me let this proposal leave my life or if it's better for you to maintain it and that's what istikhara is for right it, istikhara doesn't give you an answer right away but we pray it and we make constant dua that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala whatever it is he makes it best the best for us and the next one that isn't so concrete is is abuse it could be physical abuse it could be emotional abuse but if if there is abuse taking place in the family even if you're not the one being abused but someone else is being abused there needs to be some type of intervention in order to maintain the family because for no reason should there be any type of abuse there needs to be a type of intervention because not only is there the possibility of the ties of kinship being severed but you or I or a third person involved may be allowing injustice to take place and as Muslims we all have to stand up to any form of injustice and like I mentioned there's many abstract reasons and I'll quickly try and wrap up because I keep getting signs flashed at me <laughs> that our time is almost up and I know it's late and I don't want to hold you much longer than you guys had planned inshallah so what are some solutions and the solutions of course are more abstract than they are you know tangible but communication is key you always have to keep an open line of communication make sure that you are listening more than you are speaking we need to learn each and every single one of us to be better listeners than better speakers right we have two ears and one mouth so we need to listen twice as much as we speak and of course fear Allah we need to fear Allah in all of our dealings with our family members if you fear Allah and you remember to fear Allah you're not going to raise your voice at your parents you're not going to disrespect your aunt or uncle you're not going to you know be uh, oppressive towards your your younger sibling or your child and of course we have to use our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as an example he told us that he is the best to his families the best of you is the one who is the best to his family and the Prophet ﷺ said, I am the best to my family. There's so many examples with how he treated his wives, how he treated you know, uh, the younger companions, Anas and, his, uh, and, and, the, and the companion that was considered to be his adopted son, Zayd ibn al-Haritha and his son, Usama bin Zayd. Prophet ﷺ had so much love for them and for his grandchildren, Hassan and Hussein and for his daughter, Fatima. So many examples for us to look at and to emulate and of course I mentioned sincerity for parenting we have to maintain sincerity with our with the rest of our family as well just do it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala right the one the one who gives up arguing for the sake of Allah even if he is right right what is his reward a house in Jannah just do it for the sake of Allah just do it for the sake of maintaining peace and even your own sanity. We have to learn to let go. We have to learn to let go. And if we learn to let go, then we can maintain our own sanity. You don't want, and this is a famous saying, right? You don't want somebody to reserve real estate or space in your mind for free, right? They have to earn it. But if you cannot let it go, then, then, then we are allowing them to just sit there in our minds, right? Free of, with, without rent, free of rent. And this is also, this is, this is actually something very, very common. How do we deal with a difficult family member? How do we approach the difficult family member who is trying to cut us off, but we need to do our part in maintaining our relationship with them? First, of course, we make dua. Always make dua that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rectify, you know, my situation between myself and family member X. And then, 
Do the very, very, very basic. You see them, give salam. You give salam. If they don't respond, you did your part. But at the very least, if you have a difficult family member, give them salam. And we all know the famous hadith that we are not allowed to ignore our brother for more than three days. We are not allowed to do this. We are not allowed to ignore anyone from our family for more than three days. Does that mean that everything has to be hunky-dory after three days? That everything is all good? Uh, you know, your best friends again. You guys are going out for dinner. You know, going to watch a movie. No. But it means that you gave yourself those three days to cool down and to hopefully relieve yourself of that anger so that you can go and now say salam to them with sincerity. You don't want to force it. We still need to be sincere in giving our salam. Because the Prophet ﷺ told us to spread peace and to be merciful. Right? So this is what we need to do. And lastly, how do we foster healthy relationships with immediate and extended family members before any issues could arise? We can't prevent every issue. Some issue may come up, but I mentioned earlier, communication is key. Always keep open communication between ourselves and our family members so that nothing can blindside us or them, so that nothing can take us by surprise or take them by surprise, so that they are filled in and that we are filled in on what's going on in each other's lives. And then, of course, we need to respect our elders, respect our parents, maintain our dignity, humble ourselves to them, honor them, and have mercy upon those younger than us, our children, our younger siblings. The one who does not show mercy, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala won't have mercy on them. Right? This happened, this hadith came about because he's, a man saw the Prophet ﷺ kiss his grandson, Al-Hasan, and, and the man said, I have so many sons, and he's saying this pridefully. I have so many sons, and I don't kiss a single one of them. So then the Prophet ﷺ said this, we need to have mercy upon those younger than us. We have to have mercy upon them, or else, who's going to show us mercy? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not going to show us mercy, because we don't show mercy. So we need to have mercy upon our juniors. And then, I mentioned this already, but we have to learn to let go, right? We have to learn to let go, and I, I'm pretty sure that every time somebody mentions let go now, they think about frozen, right? <coughs> Just let it go. Something happens, let it go. Do not let it sit and fester, fester. Do not let it rot in your mind because it's going to infect you with bad feelings. If you can let it go, let it go. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> if, you can, if you can learn to let it go, then you, you will see that you can find your inner peace. And in order to cool off, just do whatever we are told in the sunnah. Do not be angry. If you're standing, sit down. If you're sitting, lay down. If you're laying down, and you should, we should do this anyways. Just go make wudu and pray two rakahs. Make it sincere. Make it sincere and for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and for the sake of releasing your anger. So I ask that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to respect our parents and allow us to honor them and give them the dignity that they deserve and allow us to maintain the ties of kinship with our immediate and extended family and to allow us to respect our elders and to have mercy upon our juniors and to allow us to just let it go. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to have mercy and uh, forgiveness upon all of us and to gather us in paradise with his beloved Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his companions as we are gathered here today. If I have said anything wrong, then it is from my own weakness and from shaitan. And whatever correct that I have said is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I hope that each and every single one of us has been able to benefit. I am just like you. I am just somebody that is out there trying to seek beneficial knowledge. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, tells us that إِذَا مَاتَ الْإِنسَانِ إِنْ قَطَعَ عَنْهُ عَمَلُهُ إِلَّا مِنْ ثَلَاثَةً And two of those we should try to hope to achieve leaving this room. Illa min thalatha, illa min sadaqatin jariya, a continuous charity. Illa min 
What's the second one? I can't hear it. <laughs> Sorry, I can't hear you guys. Illa min sadaqatin jariya, illa min ilmun, illa min ilmin yuntafa'u bihi. Knowledge that benefits others. Wa, what's the last one? Waladun salih yad'ula. A righteous child that prays for their parents. We need to pray for our parents, right? Rabbir hamhuma kama rabbayani sagira. And we need to ask our parents to pray for us. أَقُولُ مَا تَسْمَعُونَ وَاسْتَغْفِرُ اللَّهَ لِي وَلَكُمْ وَلِسَائِرِ الْمُسْلِمِينَ سُبْحَانَكَ اللَّهُمَّ وَبِحَمْدِكَ وَنَشْهَدُ وَلَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا أَنْتْ وَنَسْتَغْفِرُكَ وَنَتُوبُ إِلَيْهِ سُبْحَانَ رَبِّكَ رَبِّ الْعِزَّةِ عَمَّا يَصِفُونَ وَسَلَامٌ عَلَى الْمُرْسَلِينَ وَالْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ WhatsApp groups. <laughs> okay, Bismillah, Alhamdulillah, Salatu Salam ala Rasulillah. Before I start, may Allah Subhanahu wa Taala bless and reward every single one of the organizers and the organization for all the good and hard work that they do and allow us all to benefit from them. Ameen. And um, also, uh, before I forget, if you saw during the quiz the the picture that they showed of the major sins. That's actually the cover of the book that I was recommending to you. That, if you see that cover, that's the one that has the good translation. Because the PDF online is just terrible. There's a very famous translator. Her name is uh, Aisha Abdurrahman Bouli. She's from the UK. And she's translated tons of books. And very, these aren't like beginner type books. This isn't for like the layperson. She's translated a lot of like heavy, heavy duty books. So her translations are, are normally top-notch. So um, there's no surprise that this one is uh, the same. It's very, very good. So for, if you have large families, um, you may think I was joking when I said WhatsApp groups, but that's, that's how we do it nowadays. Raise your hand if you have a family WhatsApp group. Family WhatsApp group. You have a WhatsApp group just for your family. Raise your hand if you have a WhatsApp group for your siblings so that your parents don't see what you're talking about. <laughs> right? Ra ra and, and it could extend to even your cousins, right? Um, I come from a quite large family. So I have, right, if, if, I, had, if I had a wedding with just, if, if at my wedding we had just invited my immediate side, meaning my aunts and uncles and their children, and my wife only invited her aunts and uncles and their children. I'm not exaggerating. It could probably get to like three, 400 people. So alhamdulillah, I was blessed with a large family, but extended, right? Cousins, uncles, like that. But there's, there's, there's a way to uh, maintain ties with them nowadays. Technology has made it very easy. And just, just make it a point every three days, if you're really busy, just take out one minute and just say, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How's everyone doing? That's it. That's the bare minimum that we need to do for our part. Of course, we, have, we should do more. We should do more because of all of the reward and all the benefits. Right? If you work harder to maintain the ties of kinship, the hadith mentions for the one who loves to increase his, his provisions, his sustenance, and his life, then keep the ties of kinship. So the harder you work, then hopefully by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the more you'll receive. And there's another narration actually that says that for the one who cuts it, the ties of kinship, then his provision and sustenance will be cut off and his lifespan will be shortened. So, for those with the death wish that I hope nobody has, right? start, start calling up those uh, family members and tell them you never want to speak to them again. A'udhu Billah. But that, that's, that's how it is. You cut them off, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to cut everything off from you. And if you maintain it, you, you get back what you put in. You work hard to maintain it, 
then of course Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reward us accordingly. So, uh, Allah ta'ala alam, I hope that uh, clarifies the question. Uh, the second question is, we are asked to obey our husband, so what does one do when the husband asks the wife to break life with the family as he can't get along with the signals? I always like to give the smart, short answer first. So, you only have one set of parents that you can never replace. You can replace your husband. Okay? If he's asking you to do something like this, then you need, somebody needs to get involved because it's not okay. If he doesn't get along, he still, he still said yes to marry you. Right? He still chose to marry you. I don't think anybody held a gun to his head and said you have to marry this woman. So he needs to understand that with marriage, it's not just the individual, you're marrying the entire family. If you don't get along, or if we find ourselves not getting along with somebody or a family member from your in-laws, then just do the bare minimum. Fake it till you make it. Just, you, you have to treat them with honor and dignity and it should be sincere. I'm not saying fake your sincerity. But if in your mind that, you know, you're being sincere and trying to maintain those relationships with them, you have to smile and say, how are you doing? It may not be easy because in your heart you don't really get along with them, but just do it. It's not, it's not, up, it's not the husband's decision to command the wife to break ties with their family and vice versa. Right? The woman cannot say, I don't like your mother, kick her out. You only have one mother, you can have another wife. And like I said, I mentioned this for the wife as well. <laughs> this man does not need to be your only husband. Your husband should be your only husband, but he doesn't need to be the one. Right? So uh, there needs to be some type of intervention there so that the, the spouses can figure it out to where the husband is no longer asking her to cut off ties with the family. Of course, if the family is like a bad influence and they're on, like all they do is just influence the family into doing the wrong things and committing sins then you try to advise them but but it's not it's not the husband's right to ask her to cut off ties with them outside of shirk there's no reason like committing shirk and committing like heinous evil deeds masiyah itham them all of these sayya there should not be any real reason for a, a husband to Ask his wife to cut off ties. Uh, so of course, how do we communicate with our parents without being harsh whenever we have different views on certain matters if our parents don't practice good communication? It's either, the, it's either their view or nothing. So, every child that has a dispute with their parent probably thinks that the parent does not know how to communicate. And that may be true, because if there was open communication from the start, then this issue could be resolved in a good manner. But because there was some bumps in the road and some hiccups in the communication, it came to a conflict that needed to be resolved. Like I mentioned, uh, we need to remember to fear Allah. It's, I know it's easier said than done. In a situation, emotions get high and it's very, very difficult to control yourself. Especially because I, I feel like when, when, it's your, when it's your parents, you yourself or we, us as the child, we have this expectation that because they're our parent, they should understand. Because their job is to take care of us and there should be unconditional love, they should understand that A, maybe we don't want to do what they're telling us or B, um, they should understand why we're doing something. But at the end of the day, we were not raised like our parents were. Our parents were not raised like our grandparents were. Our children were not, were, will not be raised like we were. Every, every generation will have a different set of circumstances with different challenges to face. 
and different um, advantages as well. Right? When growing up, I, I don't know if I'm dating myself, but I don't consider myself old or anything. We didn't have smartphones. If we wanted to use the internet, when was the first time I used the internet? I was like seven or eight years old. Right? You, had to, you had to listen to the annoying modem sound, 56K modem, dial up. Right? Nowadays, kids will hear that and, and think that you know, the, the computer's going to blow up. But they, they didn't have to deal with that. But not having to deal with that means that they're exposed to more a lot faster. And it does affect uh, the mind and, and the attitude. If you notice that, that children who have a ton of screen time, their, their disposition, their, their, uh, their nature, the way they act, it's much, much different than the one who does not have a lot of screen time. The one who does not have screen time is much more calm. They're much more collected. They're able to you know, formulate a proper thought, whereas the one with a ton of, a ton of screen time is more aggressive, is more irritable, and uh, quite, quite frankly, they, they seem like a zombie. Right? So we, we have to realize that our situation was different than theirs, than our parents, and our children's situation is different than ours. So as the parent, we have to realize that they may not agree with everything we, we say, but you have to educate the child. This is why I'm telling you this. This is why I think it's like this. You know, it's not enough for a parent to just say just because. This is how it is. I'm the parent, do what I say. They need to know why. And as the, ch as the child, I mentioned that as a child, there's not much we can do. We just try to control our anger. We just try to hear them out. And maybe we can ask why if our parents are open to answering. But usually when you ask why, it makes the situation worse. If it's not something that's going to kill you, just do it. Right? Just swallow your pride. There's no reason why we should have pride with our parents. Right? They, they did things that was against their pride in order to uh, take care of us. Right? Maybe, maybe uh, the parent had to take on a job that he didn't want to do. That was clearly beneath him, but he did it in order to take care of his family. Right? Maybe, the, maybe the mother had to do something in the same manner. So if they were able to set aside their pride in order to raise us, we have to set aside our pride in order to uh, maintain our relationship with them and honor them and to respect them. Okay, that's a tough one. Um, one, I would recommend that if, if the person who this happens to, because it's not a single case, it happens all the time, very sadly, and it's uh, happening more and more often. If, if the child was abandoned or abused in any way, first of all, if, if that person is having trouble coming to terms with whatever happened, then they should see um, a mental health professional. Right? You, you go see a mental health professional and they will help uh, guide you or walk you through or lead you in a direction that will help you come to terms and come to peace with whatever has happened. Aside from that, for the spiritual guidance, of course you would need to turn to uh, a chaplain or an imam for the religious aspect. Um, I'm not a mental health professional, so I can't give that side. But uh, the parent or the family member has no right to have done those things to you. Right? We cannot abandon our children. Our parents cannot abandon us. We cannot abuse our children, and our parents cannot abuse us. If this happens and there's no, how do you say it, there's no change from the parent, or there's no sense of repentance, or uh, any, any sight of them feeling bad for it, right? Because part of repentance is regret. If there's no regret from this, then their matter is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and they will get what they deserve on the Day of Judgment. If it is difficult for the child to be around those people and in that environment, 
then I pray myself that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes it easy upon us and that we are able to find a way to uh, solidify our, our ground in that environment. But if not, then this, it's, a really, it's a really tough situation, very, very tough situation. Because it's, it's really hard to tell somebody to just cut off their family. But like I mentioned, if it's, if it's something very toxic that is affecting you, not just your, your mental or your physical health, which it probably does affect very badly, but also your, your spiritual health, then I, I don't think that you would be blameworthy for trying to remove yourself from that situation, from that environment. But because the rights of the parents are, their, are the rights that they have, uh, we, we still need to find a way to do it in a respectful uh, manner. And honestly, I, I don't see a child being able to remove themselves very easily if that were to be the case. I don't, I don't think that somebody, of course, if somebody abandoned you, then they're trying not to be in your life. If they abandoned you, then I, I don't think that they, they would try to stay in your life. Sometimes you have it where, where a child is abandoned and later on the parent regrets it and tries to, uh, try to, tries to re-enter themselves into that person's life. If that happens, then we need to try and be the bigger person and try to find a way in our hearts to be able to forgive them so that it allows us to be able to fulfill the rights that they have upon us if and only if it was just for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then that can be enough. Right? Not because you think that they deserve it, but at the very least, you want to do it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But if it's somebody that's abusing you, then probably they're not going to try, they're not going to let you go. Right? I, I don't think an abuser would let the abusee run away. In that case, if it's, if it's really bad and no type of intervention is helping, then of course you want to remove yourself from harm mental harm, physical harm, uh, emotional harm, spiritual harm, it, it's up to us to take care of ourselves. Right? If, if the family is not taking care of us, we have to take care of ourselves. But seek help, right? professional help, whether it's through, through a judge even, or through a, a therapist, or through, through the imam, the qadi. Just seek, don't be afraid to, to seek help in that situation. To first try and rectify the situation. If it's not rectified, than to get yourself out of that situation. Sorry, I know that was a long-winded answer, but this is a very uh, deep topic that, that is being, it's not that it didn't happen before, but it's being spoken about more, and rightfully so, because these things need to be spoken about, but there needs to be like a broader uh, panel of uh, experts to tackle a topic like this, because, because it, it, just, it just doesn't fit into, um, you know, an Islamic um, solution, right? Of course, uh, we, we need to make sure our solution follows the guidelines that is set to us by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His Messenger.